and other topics. You know, that really does get to the next question I was going to ask you, because I have a lot here in my channel. We've got a lot of people that tune in that are either Catholic. I have a lot of Eastern Orthodox mods, a lot of evangelical mods, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. people that love the faith. Mm -hmm. And they're going to wonder, what is a Hadith? What is yes. a Hadith? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I shouldn't just like throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> without any explanation. Uh, so, William, in um, in Islamic theology, there are two sources of revelation. So the first, as many will know, is the Qur'an, understood by Muslims to be the very word of God brought down from the angel Gabriel, from God to the prophet Muhammad. Um, but, you know, the, the Qur'an is a relatively short book. It's about 60% of the New Testament in length. Um, and it's mostly filled with, I mean, we'll be speaking a lot about this. But it's mostly filled with exhortation, um, stories of the prophets, uh, references to heaven and hell, some legal material, but there's not a lot of practical advice. So just to give one simple example, um, everyone knows Muslims pray five times a day, mm -hmm. but the Quran never speaks about um, the obligation to pray five times a day. So all, a, a lot of the details like that one come in the second source of revelation, which are books which contain reports of either the sayings or the deeds of Muhammad, reported usually by his companions or by one of his wives. Um, and uh, they are understood by Muslims to be um, also divine revelation and authoritative in terms of guidance on both theological and, um, and practical matters. Uh, but it, uh, the, the hadith are not the word of God in the same way that the Quran is. So the articulation of the words are not understood to be God's articulation. It's Muhammad's speech, not God's speech. Therefore, it wouldn't be read like liturgically. It wouldn't be okay. part of Muslim prayer. So that's a Yeah, and I mean, thinking in terms of, uh, well, at least Catholic theology, it, there's a rough correspondence between scripture and tradition. I mean, it's not a really exact correspondence. Scripture, tradition to, to Quran and Hadith. That is a fantastic uh, explanation. I greatly appreciate it. And I think it really does get to the heart of the issue. So then, really, really... The, the a hadith would not be put on an authoritative level as the text within the Quran. Is that correct? Okay, so yes and no. Okay. When it comes to questions of, um, to legal questions, and law in Islam is really broad. Right. So law could be matters of civil law, family law, could be marriage, divorce, crime, something like that. But law could also be like how, how you pray, um, uh, ritual purity, all these things. So when it comes to those sorts of questions, they're equal. The, okay. the, the hadith have authority similar to that of the Quran. But when it comes to um, uh, sort of the, um, the, 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 the sacred nature of the text, only the Quran is the word of God. So Muslims who read the Quran, even if they don't understand the Arabic, understanding that they're fulfilling an obligation by doing so, and will have some sort of merit or virtue by the act of, of reading the Quran. So just to give an example, I mean, Muslims in say Malaysia or Indonesia, it's a very large Muslim countries, Indonesia's, Indonesia's the largest mm -hmm. Muslim country. The vast majority will not understand the Quran when they read it in Arabic, but they'll still read it in Arabic because there's a certain reward or blessing that comes with that act. If that makes sense. So that, and that would, that's only for the Quran, right? Reading the Hadith, you only do it when you're seeking guidance or information. Okay, One, that, that is a fantastic answer. Now, do, do we know more or less when the, the Hadiths were, were authored? That is a really thorny, thorny question. So, um, okay, let me give two answers. The, the traditional answer is, um, well, I mean, composition of the Hadith means the act of Muhammad saying, what he said or doing what he did. Yeah. And then there were eyewitnesses who passed it down to the next generation, to the next generation, next generation, kind of a little bit like apostolic authority or succession mm -hmm. uh, until they were finally compiled um, principally in the ninth century. So the most okay. famous book of Hadith, um, you can sort of see it uh, <laughs> over this <laughs> shoulder there, the, the blue and white book. Um, that's the English translation of a book known as Bukhari. Yeah. Um, and uh, so um, that he, Bukhari dies in the year 870. And so that's when it's finally written down. So that's sort of the traditional answer. Now, the critical sort of 
academic critical answer is, uh, while a lot of scholars doubt whether these are authentic statements of Muhammad or authentic reports of his deeds or actions, and there's all sorts of arguments for that, which we could get into, but I'll resist the temptation right now. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so these, um, these reports could actually not, in fact, be transmitted from Muhammad himself, but could be late sort of um, uh, uh, speculation or complete inventions, which are attributed to Muhammad to give authority to the points of views communicated in the hadith. So they could have, their, their actual origin could have been in the 8th or 9th century and not in the 7th century. By the way, Muhammad's prophetic career by tradition is between 610 and 632. So a, a bit after, a bit after then, they would have been um, authored perhaps. If you yeah, will. the standard line of, of Western scholarship is, listen, there's so much anachronistic stuff in the hadith and there's, there's so many um, contradictions, so different mm -hmm. views being attributed to Muhammad on things like free will, um, but even simple things about like what you dress, what you should wear, how you should eat. Like, uh, there's so much, so much variation in there that it's probably these hadith were created in the eighth and ninth centuries by Muslims who were seeking answers to everyday questions, but also theological questions. That would be sort of the standard line. In recent years, I would say the last 25 to 30 years, there's a move in scholarship to defend the traditional view. Um, a number mm. of three German scholars in particular have pushed very hard on this and come up with methods that seeks to redeem the Hadith to a certain extent. So right now it's a big, big debate and dispute. And yeah. how, how, how cogent are those arguments that those German theologians are putting forward? In your opinion, do you, do you think they have, um strength to them? Well, I would say there is a major step forward in these arguments because traditionally, like some of the books that are behind me mm -hmm. um, are what are called biographical dictionaries. So uh, I try not to get too much in the weeds with this, but it's actually kind of interesting. So um, if there's a report, for example, let's say one report I was discussing with my students here at Notre Dame today. Um, there's a hadith in the book of Bukhari. Let's see if I can get the shoulder right right up there, <laughs> um, in the book of Bukhari, in which um, Muhammad's beloved wife, Aisha, says the prophet used to do every daily action beginning with his right hand or his right foot, beginning with the right. So putting on shoes or combing his hair, he would do with the right. Now, if you read that hadith, before the report, the words of his wife, Aisha, you have a list of names. So say, um, uh, I heard from, this is Bukhari saying, I heard mm -hmm. from such and such a person who heard from such and such a person who heard from such and such a person who heard from Aisha that she said. So that's that's called a chain of transmission. Now, okay. traditional Islamic books rely almost uniquely on this chain of transmission to evaluate the authenticity of a hadith. What the German, and, and then that was sort of, sort of criticized by Western scholars beginning in the 19th century. You have to look at the nature of the port itself. Is it anachronistic? Yep. Does it conflict with something in the Quran? Does it reflect uh, theological debates of a later era? These sorts of things. So Western scholars were like, yeah, based on the, the Isnad itself, like you can't go very far. Sorry, the chain of transmission itself, you can't mm -hmm. go very far. What these three German scholars have done recently is they said, we're going to look at the report and the chain of transmissions, I said the Arabic word for it, isnad, <laughs> and we're gonna put them together. And they actually work in a highly technical way of charting correspondences between the chain of transmission and the nature of the ports in oh. variant versions of the same hadith. And they come up with very detailed charts that are supposed to take you back to the actual ancestor of a certain report. And so they say some, but not all, can actually be authentic coming from the seventh century. Thank you.